Morning, Church. Um, just need to correct one or two things. I'm not Mark's grand um, father-in-law. I'm he's my son-in-law. <laughs> uh, when I was a boy, uh, school was a joy to me. I loved, simply loved school. The vast majority of it was brilliant, but one part of it. When I was, I don't know what you'd call it here, but at junior school, one part of it at junior school, I never really enjoyed. And that was football, or as people call it, soccer. Just didn't enjoy that at all. I don't mean the stuff that you play here, AFL, Australian ruleless football, <laughs> which I absolutely adore. I can say words that I don't understand, like gulagong. Um, I can say manly. I can say St Kilda. I don't know what I mean by those. I don't know what they're trying to do apart from kicking it through four sticks, six points for one and one point for the other. Am I doing OK? Okay, so that's, that's more or less it. But my problem was this game called soccer. My first problem with that is that soccer isn't even a sport. <laughs> now, cricket's a sport. I love cricket. I love watching it, and I love playing it. And I used to play it badly. It makes no difference to me who wins. I just love the game. Well, I say I didn't mind, I did mind when it was Australia playing the West Indies. If Australia won, I would be really disappointed. But I'm thankful that throughout my life, watching the Aussies play the Windies, I, I've hardly ever been disappointed. <laughs> now, rugby's a sport. I, again, I don't really mind who wins. Well, I, I like it best when the French lose. <laughs> but I don't really mind who wins, because I just love the game. And someone will point out that the West Indies doesn't play rugby, and the only reason for that is that we want other nations to enjoy this thrill of winning something. <laughs> My dislike of soccer started from my school days, my junior school days, when I would be eight, nine, ten years of age. It would be playtime and we would all go out and we would line up, no particular order, just a line of bodies, sometimes eight, sometimes twenty, um, sometimes forty would line up and then you would start picking. Someone would have the ball under the arm, is that the sort of thing you used to do? Yes? And you'd have somebody else? Yes? and then they would choose people, and then they'd start picking people. And we'd have them all lined up, and then uh, someone would say, I'll have John, and I'll have Michael, and I'll have Richard, and I'll have Barry, and I'll have Rolo, and I'll have Bob. All the boys were picked, but not quite all of them. And then they'd start on the girls. <laughs> I'll have Anita, and then there was Cecilia, and then there was Samantha, and then there was Geraldine with the squint. <laughs> and then there was Ursula who had a leg in plaster. <laughs> and then there was Selma. And then there was me. <laughs> then the next captain would say, when there's only three of us left, squinty Geraldine. Another girl and myself, they would say this, and this would be the most cri crippling thing, especially when there was an odd number. So they'd be me and there'd be two girls. No, the next sentence might offend you, but I was a child of the 70s. Okay, I was a child of the 60s. Okay, I was a child of the 50s. The thing that really hurt me was the fact that even the girls got picked before me. Even Squinty, Geraldine got picked before me. And there'd be three of us there, two girls and me. And they would say, 
we'll have the two girls, you can have Eddie. That's how bad it was. That's what I was left with. You see, I finally worked out how to solve the problem, but if you want to know, I'll tell you how to solve the problem. But the thing was this, that I was never chosen, never once in my junior school days, altogether. As if you mean it. <laughs> I was never chosen. I was always last. And then the final insult was this, that they used to put me in goal so that I was away from everything that was going on. That's how bad this, this was. Now, when it comes to soccer, which really isn't a sport, that's one thing. But when it comes to life, it's quite another. And maybe because of your background, your family history, your makeup, your race, your gender, that you've been told by someone that I don't love you anymore. Perhaps you've felt the sting of being let down or even used or betrayed. There's something hurt inside when you know that you've not been chosen or somebody else has been chosen ahead of you or someone has been chosen instead of you. There's a pain in that, which I know about because I was never picked for the football team. That's the kind of picture I want to leave with you just for a moment. And I just wonder, do you know what it is because of your background or your history, because of your race or your gender, because you've been told that I love you and then soon afterwards be told that I don't love you anymore? Have you felt the sting of being used or the pain of being betrayed? These are the things that are real in life and these are the things that affect us in life. And I want to tell you that God is looking for people. I'm not here to bo boost your self-esteem or to tell you that you're amazing. That's like painting over graffiti with watercolour paint. It's okay for a while until it rains. Then it all washes away and you're back to where you are. I don't want to go to church and to be told I'm awesome. When I know that deep down inside I'm a wreck. I don't want to be told that. I don't want my self-esteem to be pumped up like a balloon until finally it bursts and I'm left in a worse condition than I was before. I need something that's going to be real for me. And so I don't want to tell you how awesome you are or how amazing you are. I want to tell you the truth as I see it from God's word. I want to tell you that God is on the lookout for certain kinds of people and that the likelihood is that you qualify. So let's have a look at our verses. There's only two verses, aren't I kind? I remember last week. Didn't we have some verses last week? Man alive. We had, we had all the Bible apart from Obadiah, didn't we, last week? <laughs> Let's look at our verses today. They're from Isaiah 66, verses 1 and 2. Thus says the Lord, Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. What is the house that you would build for me, and what is the place of my rest? All these things my hand has made, and all these things came to be, declares the Lord. But this is the one to whom I will look. He who trembles and, if, and has a contrite spirit. Sorry, he who is humble and a contrite spirit and trembles at my word. I want to make this clear and make it simple, nothing profound today, but I must make it clear, this is God that is speaking. This is God who says this. This is the creator of everything who is speaking, and he says, what are you going to build for me? What is it possible that you could build for me? 
All these things my hands have made. All these things came to be, declares the Lord. But this is the, the one to whom I will look. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. This is God speaking these words to his people. Now, as God says these things, he is looking to speak into the lives of people. He is the one who is looking for you. Isn't that an amazing thought? That the God of heaven, the God of all creation, is looking for you. He is looking for me. He is looking for people. And he says, this is the kind of person that I want you. To find, he says, this is the person that, to whom I look. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. Now, let's see what else he says. I want to read to us and we'll just go very, through it very quickly from the previous chapter, Isaiah 65, 17 through 25. And it says this, For behold, I create a new heaven and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy and her people to be a gladness. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. No more shall be heard in it the sound of weeping or crying or distress. No more shall there be in it an infant who lives only a few days or an old man who does not fill out his days. For the young man shall die at a hundred years of age and the sinner a hundred years old shall be accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be. And my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain or bear children for calamity. For they shall be the offspring of the blessed, the blessed of the Lord." and their descendants with them. Before they call, I will answer. Did you hear that? Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall graze together. The lion shall eat straw like an ox. The dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt or destroy in all of my holy mountain, says the Lord. This passage is saying to us, that God created heaven and earth. He created everything that there is. He is the creator. He is the source of joy. He is the source of gladness. He is the source of rejoicing. He is the one who gives life meaning and fulfillment. He is working a work of joy and his promises, he promises to be present with us and in the middle of all trouble to be with us. That's an amazing thing because I want you to understand the God who speaks these words. The problem we all have, I've heard it here, the problem we all have is our understanding of God is too small. God is way bigger than anything that we can imagine. What he can do is way bigger than anything we have a concept of. Did you sing this morning? Did you sing this morning? He is vast, he is great. There's a hymn that says this, if I can remember. It's an old hymn in your face, Tom. Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus. Yes? Vast, unmeasured, boundless, free, gushing like a mighty ocean in its fullness over me. All around me is the presence of his love, for it lifts me up to glory, lifts me to my God above. You see, the God that we worship, the God that we're speaking of, is this God who is immense. He is enormous. He fills not just heaven and earth. He fills it all. He puts it uh, in the text that we have looked at um, in, the, in the chapter 65. He is majestic in all that he does. And he says that he is on the lookout for people. 
He is immense and he's looking out for you. Our text indicates that the people in the time of Isaiah were thinking of building a place for God. And we read, what is the house that you can build for me? And what is the place of my rest? In simple language, God is saying this. Do you think that I need anything? The heavens are spectacular. Have you seen these new pictures from the thing that's gone up? Aren't they immense? Someone I read reading a couple of days ago they held up a picture the size of a grain of sand that held a billion galaxies. Yes? This is the God who is on the lookout. And it may just be that whether you know him or not this morning, he's looking for you. And it may just be that you as a Christian who are crumpled and bruised and battered and not knowing what today or tomorrow might bring, that he's on the lookout for you. He says this. Can you hold the picture of all the galaxies in your mind? Can you do that for me? The heavens, as spectacular as they are, says God, are a lounge chair to me. And the earth, with all its wonders is just a footstool. I want you to understand the God that is looking for you. I want you to understand that when I use the term God, I'm using the term of an immense God. In fact, we have to say, don't we, the only true God. There is no one like him and there's no one beside him. It is this God who is on the search for someone. He is on the search to tell someone that they are valued that they are wanted, and they are chosen. Someone here is saying, thanks for that, but you don't mean me. Can I say that again? Eddie, thanks for that. You reminded me that God is immense, or I may not have reminded you, you may have heard it for the first time. God is immense, he's huge, he's massive, but he's not looking for me because... I'm not charismatic, I'm not got immense talents, I'm broken, I'm downtrodden, I'm hurt and damaged, I'm fearful and disappointed, I'm depressed, I'm, de I'm betrayed. Things have been said that I thought somebody meant, and it's proved to be false. Eddie, you, you said that God is immense, and okay, I'll understand that. But he can't be looking for me because he's got to be looking for someone that's got something to offer, hasn't he? He's got to be looking for someone that's charismatic or dynamic or someone with huge intellect or tremendous resources. Well, I want to say to you this. You may just be the person that God is looking for. The God of heaven is looking for you. To him, you this morning are a wanted person. He is not after you because he needs you. Because God needs nothing. God is looking at you, looking for you. Can I just make sure you can hear me? Yes? He is not looking for you because he needs you. You can finish the sentence yourself, can't you? He is looking for you not because he needs you, but because he wants you. This morning, you are a wanted person. Yes, Ned Kelly? <laughs> a wanted person. And people would hunt him down. Yes? And the God of heaven has unleashed the hounds of grace. And he is hunting you down. And that's not just for you this morning who don't know him. That's for you that do. He is looking for someone. He is looking, as he says in his words, he is looking for someone who is humble, someone who is contrite, and someone who trembles at his word. Well, let's have a look at humble first. Humble, firstly, does not mean putting yourself down or always taking the back seat. Listen to me, I am really good at maths. 
I am really good at maths. I mean, I'm, I'm really good at maths. If I said different to that, I'm telling you a lie. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm really good at maths. I'm rubbish at football. And God made me that way. Does that make sense? Being humble does not mean putting yourself down. Well, in this moment, I want to say this, that perhaps humility is better taught by seeing than by telling. So let me just run through scripture quickly if I can. Matthew 11. If you want to see what humility is, then my answer to you is to look at Jesus. Jesus in Matthew 11 says this, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Okay? So if we look at Jesus, we will see something of what humility is like. In Jesus, I see the God-man putting people before popularity and putting people before mission. I'm taking you to Matthew 5. I'm assuming that you know bits of scripture. Is that okay? Matthew 5, Jesus lands. The Bible, I, went, I never ever understand it. It doesn't say there was a crowd with him. It says there's a large crowd. I thought that meant the same thing. But it's an emphasis, isn't it? It wasn't just a lot of people. It was a lot, a lot of people. There's this crowd of people, and he walks on, and you can imagine... Um, like the seas parting as this man called Jairus comes up, a synagogue leader, and he's coming towards Jesus. And he's the top man. You can imagine the whole thing moving to one side, and he comes to Jesus. Something I'm grateful that I've never had to say. Grateful that I've never had to say. And he comes to Jesus and says, My little girl's ill. My little girl's at the point of death. Will you come? You can imagine the whole crowd goes, and Jesus says, yeah, of course. And he's heading off with this man, Jairus, and the crowd is saying, ooh, he's going to do something here, isn't he? Ooh, and off he goes, and they're going along, and people are bumping against him, and suddenly he stops, and he says, who touched me? Who touched me? And his disciples say, I've just finished preaching a set of sermons on this. I'll use the phrase, you're having a laugh, Lord. <laughs> this, you're in the middle of a large crowd. They're all bumping against you. Some of them are falling down. Some of them think you're great. Some of them think you're fantastic. What do you mean? And he says, no, 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 no. Somebody touched me. And he spends time and he doesn't move from the spot. Can you imagine what Dyrus is doing at this moment? <laughs> And he says, and this woman falls at his feet. And he, she, he says, what's this? And she says, it was me, it was me. And he turns to her and says, hey girl, there's no magic in this. Your faith has made you well. And then he goes off, walks to the door. Everybody's ranting and raving. Why wouldn't they? I don't know if you've ever been to the bed of a 14-year-old. I can't count them on two of my hands, the number of children I've sat with and watched them die. Can't tell you, it's a horrible place. And he says, oh, you're all wrong, she's asleep. And he says to her, get up. And up she gets. This is the God who puts people before mission. In Mark and chapter 10, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem to die. Can I say that again? He's on his Jerusalem to die. And there's a blind beggar called Bartimaeus. And Bartimaeus sort of says, hey, hey guys, what's happening? What's this crowd? Big crowd, big money earners. Yeah? Big crowd, big money earners. And he, he says, what's happening? And they say, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And he says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And they turn on him and say, shut your face. Isn't the Bible clear? Shut up. Do you know who this is? This is the Messiah. This is the big cheese. This is the great one. 
And Jesus keeps on going. And then he says, this man, Bartimaeus, says the word. Please listen. The word that I guarantee you this morning will stop Jesus in his tracks. This word. The only word that I know that will chop, stop Jesus in his tracks. And he says, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stops and calls him. Can I ask you this morning, I don't know where you are in this. I don't know whether you are not saved. I don't know whether you understand what that means. I don't know whether you're a Christian that's put on the Christian face and managing to keep people at arm's length, which is sometimes a good thing. I'm just trying to say to you, if you say, Jesus, have mercy on me, I can guarantee on the authority of God's word that Jesus will stop for you. Did you hear me? In John chapter 11, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem and his friend Lazarus has died and he stops for the family. In Luke 23, Jesus is nailed to a cross with a thief either side of him. And Jesus stops midstream in his mission to make an individual more important than the mission in that moment. So can I just say this to you, because it's a wonderful song that was sung this morning. Can I just say this to you? That this Jesus sees you. And he knows you. And he's aware of you. This king of heaven is hunting you down because he's interested in you. And you can know what being humble means because you can see it in him. So if you're not a Christian this morning, he's looking for you. And how do I know that? If your heart is saying to you, I don't want to live life on my own without Jesus. I can't manage it. I need help. This is the beginning for you to turn to him. It isn't the whole story. There's a lot more to come. But that's the beginning. Jesus, would you have mercy on me? Because he comes to the broken. And you are more important, and I'm grateful the church knows this. You are more important than any mission that can be carried out throughout the whole of Sydney, Australia. God is interested in you in such a way. And when I say God, I mean the maker of all things visible and invisible. So what does contrition mean? Well, I want to tell you a story. Have I got enough time for this? There's a lady that was in our church. Her name was Rita. Rita was, oh, just something else. Um, and Rita, uh, she was new to the things of God. She was learning to pray. She was learning to worship. She was learning to read her Bible. And one day I got a phone call. And she phoned up and she said, Pastor, would you please come and would you come for tea? Well, we're so badly paid. Amen, brother? <laughs> a free meal, you know what I mean? Especially if you bring your bag with you, and when they've turned around, you can stick some stuff in. Yeah, okay. So I went round, I went round to Rita for this meal, and uh, I went in, and well, the only way I can describe it was this table was groaning under the weight of food. There was so much food there. I thought, she's invited the whole church. And I said, oh, who else is coming? And she said, excuse me, she said, no one else, Pastor, just you and me. And she said, would you like a cup of tea? And I said, yes. I don't know if this happens to you, but I got the best cup and saucer. Oh, it doesn't happen to you. I got the best cup and saucer, you know, a little dinky thing. You know what I mean? You know, have you seen those common people that, that dunk biscuits? You know those people, yeah? Well, you couldn't, you couldn't dunk in this cup. It was so frou-frou. Okay. So I had this cup of tea, 
And she said, would you like a sandwich? Well, there were, I'm not exaggerating, there were hundreds of these things. There was cakes, you, you name a cake, it was there. And this was all laid out for me. And I thought to myself, this is a bit excessive. I know I'm brilliant, but... <laughs> and I said to her, Rita, what's all this about? And she began to cry and she said this, I want to tell you about my life. And she told me about her life. I sat there, listening to her life, and when she'd finished, and I'm almost quoting her here, she said this, I wanted you to know, so that if you wanted to send me out of the church, you'd know why. That's contrition. Yes? She was living with this. Wasn't it wonderful to bring her through to what God had done as a young Christian? I was conscious in her front room that I wasn't walking in her front room. I was walking through a human soul. Please listen to this. That is the toughest part of a pastor's job. It will break many a man. It's the hardest place to be. I could see the pain that she was in, the willingness to let me into an area of her life. And I thought of the things that I had done and failed at before I was a Christian. And I continued to think of the things that I had done and failed at since I became a Christian. And there was contrition in my heart as I spoke to her. If you are called to walk in the lives of people and to walk with human souls, let us please walk gently with a sense of contrition. Again, we look at the life of Jesus, the woman caught in adultery. You know the story, don't you? John 8, I think it is. This woman is caught in the very act of adultery. And these people are around her. Goodness knows where the bloke was. But the woman had been caught. And you can see them all there with their stones. Oh, you know, I really want you to hear this. Please, I want you to hear this. And they accuse her. And Jesus starts writing on the ground. And he says this. Please listen. Because I, I, I'm not one of your normal people, I don't think. But I think this is from God for you. And uh, he looks up and he says, the one that's without sin, you can throw the first stone. And it says, one by one they went away. Listen to this. And then he looked up and he said to her, who condemns you? She looked and she said, ready for this? No one, Lord. And he says, nor do I. Off you go, don't sin again. So can I say that to you this morning? Can I start with my brothers and sisters? We mess up, don't we? Don't we? Can I say this to you? Who condemns you? And your answer is? No one, Lord. Do you hear me? I'm saying this to you. And I hope I'm saying it to you in his name. Who condemns you? I don't know what your sins have been, but the cross is bigger. I'm going to have to miss a bit of this out. I want to say to you that sometimes people hang between hope and horror. And that might be you today. We are talking of God and I want to read just a couple of verses for you. The first part, you will have no problem understanding at all. Is that okay? The first part, you will have no problem understanding at all. The second part... If you understand some of this, you'll find so difficult. This is Isaiah 57 and verse 15. But this is what the high and exalted one says. He who lives forever, whose name is holy. I live in a high and holy place. Do you understand all that? Now comes the hard part but also with the one 
who is contrite and lowly in spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. Did you hear that? We, see, we speak of glory. We speak of heaven. We speak of eternity. Glorious words that we sang. But where does he dwell as well? In the hearts of those who are humble and contrite. And that's why I know he lives with me. He lives with those that are saying, I can't do this on my own. Those of you that don't know Christ. You know church, but you don't know Christ. I'm saying this to you. You are being hunted down by a relentless God who wants to live in the hearts of those that are humble and contrite. And the journey begins with you saying, Lord, I need you. And he will reply and say, well, who condemns you? And you've got three words to say, maybe four. No one, Lord. And he will say, do you know what comes next? Nor do I. Brand new start. And then it says, finally, God's word is a warning who tremble at his word. Jesus Christ had been crucified. He had died. He'd been buried. And it's the third day he'd risen from the dead. He was walking to Emmaus and two disciples were there. And you know the story. And he, they said, didn't our hearts burn within us as we walked with him on the way? They were there and there was something about him that made their hearts just full of joy and excitement. What does it mean? When it says tremble. Well I want to make sure that you understand this if I may. When I look through my reading of revival. When I look through my reading of the saints of old. This is what fear means. Those who tremble. In 1904 revival hit Wales. Thousands were being brought into the church. And there's the story about miners. Coal miners. Who were, and slate miners. Who were at the church door. Holding the, holding the handle and taking their hand off and saying to the next one, you open it. Because they knew that once they stepped in, they were moving into the presence of God and the one thing they felt was fear. Have I got time for just a couple of things? I was teaching in a classroom, just coming to my mind, and there was a, an absolute ruckus. A new teacher was having a hard time, so I walked down to this classroom and there were two boys kicking off big, big time. So I went in there big and brave and got hold of these two kids and pounded them out of this room and dragged them off to um, my office and sat them down outside. And when I came back, the headmaster was outside my room. And I'd been away 15 minutes. You shouldn't leave your classroom. What choice did I have? And I said, uh, sir, I can just display. That's, just, just, just dismiss me. He opened the door. All the kids stood up. And the head said, I've been outside this room for 15 minutes. Your teacher hasn't been there. The kids knew I was in big trouble. You understand? You could see their faces saying, what lie can we say for you, sir? <laughs> and those kids were there. And the head said, you've been on your own for 15 minutes. Not one of you has left your seat. You ready for this? Not one of you has left your seat. You've just been sitting down doing your work. I don't understand why you didn't misbehave. Somebody tell me why you didn't misbehave. Total silence until a little girl put her hand up. And she said, So we can't misbehave because he loves us. That's fear. Just the love... The head, shook it, the head teacher shook his head and walked out. And I stood there, the kids' eyes on stalks. Did we do good? <laughs> and I said, I, I don't know what we're going to do now, except we've got a free lesson. <laughs> and we just played games for the rest of that. I wanted to tell you that, because 
they were fearful for love's sake. Does that make sense? Okay, let me go on. People who met the fear of God in his word, King David, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Daniel, the list goes on and on. Now, I do not want to be brutal, please. But I really want to say to you, if your Bible reading consists of reading your daily notes, closing it, saying your three-minute prayer, and getting on with the business of the day, you will never grow to be the person that you should be in Christ. You just won't get there. Because the word of God is something that is passionate and deep and does things to us. A few weeks ago, I had to do a funeral of an old man. The family were there, and as we were talking, they brought out this tattered piece of paper. It was a love letter that his fiance had written to him when he was on the front line in the Second World War. And when they opened it, I was frightened it would just fall apart. Are you ahead of me on this? He had read it and read it and read it and read it and read it, and I'll tell you why. Because he was in love with its author. And that's why I read God's word. Because he met with me, and he turned my life around, and he changed me from a sinner into a saint, from a rebel into a prince, from an alien into a child of God. I love him. What does it mean to tremble when, oh, it's the last page. Three lines, but I can expand them. <laughs> just three things to explain what tremble means, not just fear. I was doing a wedding. This guy had shoulders the size of a whole front row of a rugby team, all on his own. A beast of a man. And he was at the front of church and I was there. And I said to him, you can't turn around till I tell you. And this girl came down. Oh, stunning or what? She got about halfway down and this beast turned around and saw her. And he turned back and he went. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely fell apart. He was crying his eyes out. He got to the front. We got to the front and we were doing the service. I had to delay the service by about 15 minutes because he was just crying. The guy just couldn't stop crying. He was shaking. It wasn't fear. So when it says to us, those that tremble at my word, do you see what I'm trying to say to you? Okay. The second one is also a wedding. This time it was the woman, different wedding. And you go through stuff with them. And I said to her... Um, halfway through the service, repeat after me. Repeat after me, she said. <laughs> I said no. And I said to her, do you take this man? I do. Do you take this man, Gerald? I do. So I said, do you take this man, Gerald, to be your lawful wedded husband, to have and to hold from this, you're scared over there, aren't you? To have and to hold from this day forward, and she looked at me, and she just flooded, and she went, I do, I do, I do, I do, I do, I do. <laughs> you got it? Yes? She was trembling because of the passion. And the last thing I want to say is this. And I don't know if you have it here. So I think Tom may have said to me that you do. But it's, they're called ice cream vans. I'm sure you have them at football games or footy. <laughs> You have, you have them at the beach, but I'm talking about a, a, a van that goes around the streets playing green sleeves or something. You know what I'm trying to say? And I'm at home in the front room, the two of the grandchildren are next door, and this thing goes on. And I see it, and I phone next door and say, are the kids into ice cream? You bet. I open the door, the two of them come out, we're standing on the street, all three of us. I'm waving. Lacey is waving. What's that other one called? <laughs> Ollie. Ollie is Ollie's just copying. He's just copying because he doesn't know what, he's, what on earth's going on. And the guy pulls up in front of us. 
and the three of us are there. And Lacey, about nine or ten, puts her hand on the counter and she knows what she wants, but she wants to see over the top just in case there's something extra. So we're there with her looking over the top. Ollie, who's this high, puts his hand on the side and goes on tiptoe, which increases his height by about half an inch. <laughs> Can't see a thing. And he looks at me and he says one word, up. So I picked him up and then Lacey's on tiptoes and I said to her, what do you want? Not a word from either of them. <laughs> Absolutely shocked. So overjoyed that they could see all the stuff and granddad had said, you can have whatever you want. And they were just full of expectation, trembling because of granddad's word. So I want to finish with this. As I'm trying to say to you, there's a God pursuing you who loves you to bits. I want to say this to you. Because it's hard road, isn't it, at times as a Christian? When things are bearing down at you, when you're worried about the kids, when you're worried about finances, when you're worried about work, when you're worried about life, you're worried about health, when you come to God and you know that the God of creation is pursuing you and you know that he's looking for those that are humble, contrite and who tremble at his word, when you come to church, when you come to your quiet place at home, can I just ask you this? Do you come to church on tiptoe, trying to look over at what he's got for you today? Is that how you come to church? What's he got for us today? Is that how you live? And perhaps you're so new to this that you don't quite understand, and so there's just one word you need to use. Daddy, up. I can't do this on my own. Up. Father God, we thank you that you're hunting people down. Such a God of grace and kindness and mercy, hunting people down. Lord, hunt people down this morning. Those that are tired in the battle, not of it, Lord, those that are feeling crushed but trying to find another step. And Lord, we pray for those that don't know you. Lord, please, would you unleash your grace on your church in Jesus' name. Amen.